Hello, everybody. This is a YouTube presentation specifically about my experience as a faculty member with assignment design, or in the case I'm going to present to you during the YouTube presentation on assignment redesign. I have some few takeaways from my own experience in trying to redesign an assignment for my course. The first is I was trying to think back and I thought what led me to reflect upon my assignment instructions. And that started with not only the discussions we were having with respect to assessment and student learning and improving student learning, but with respect to the performance of my students on their work. So I looked at their work and, and I really sometimes need to fight thinking, well, it's because the students aren't prepared or it's because the students haven't put in enough effort or taken the assignment seriously to really think back in about what was I doing as an instructor in the classroom to provide them with opportunities to practice the learning I wanted them to demonstrate and how was my assignment designed? Was I actually being clear in my assignment instructions about what I expected them to demonstrate? When I started to look at assignment redesign, so I picked up the assignment, again, the assignment I'm gonna be talking about a little bit later in the presentation, I ended up going down lots of paths that I wasn't expecting to go. And I'll talk about some of those paths again as we move through. It went well beyond course learning outcomes and program learning outcomes. The first place it started was with really thinking about my syllabus. And I've included um, a the example of my syllabus in the handouts. It would be handout one. And you'll notice in handout one, it's, it's really a packet. It includes what we call a syllabus of record. And then provided with that syllabus of record is how I um, format my syllabus for my class. So you'll see there are places in the, the syllabus where faculty have flexibility and places where they don't. So the, the part of that syllabus that's most important is there's a matrix a couple pages in, and you'll see how that matrix is common across all faculty. And that's been really important for us to bring adjuncts on board. Then the last two columns is where we have flexibility. And one of the things I began to focus on is what are the learning experiences that I'm providing so the students are prepared and have had opportunity to demonstrate their learning prior to the assignments by which I was going to evaluate and, and grade them on. The next place that this took me was thinking about scaffolding. And I thought, well, I just need to pay attention to scaffolding within my assignment or given my assignment instructions. But I realized now I have to think about scaffolding within the course because I'm looking at those learning experiences and where those learning experiences need to take place and those opportunities to dem demonstrate prior to um, administering the assignment. The next place that I, that took me was how much scaffolding within an assignment should I be doing? And in part, that basis, that's based upon what students actually had opportunities to demonstrate in their courses up to um, the point where they entered my class. So now I'm thinking about scaffolding, not just within an assignment, not just across my own course, but what kind of scaffolding have the students um, had moving into my course prior to my course, both within the major as well as within um, general education courses, which then made me look and say, OK, we need to link this as well to general education. So for two-year campuses or colleges, the general education outcomes tend to align with their institution outcomes. They tend to be one and the same. At four-year institutions, there, there tends to be a close link between your general education outcomes and your institution outcomes, but it goes beyond general education so that we are looking at what are those outcomes we want students to learn independent of their major and throughout their major as well as their general education. So they may be introduced to those outcomes in their general education courses, but if they're not reinforced through their major um, courses, 
then upon graduation, they may not be able to demonstrate those proficiencies. So now I had to think again in terms of scaffolding, what courses had they had both within my major, within the major I'm teaching, as well as outside of the major in general education or other courses. So then that took mapping to a very different place. I hadn't really completely understood mapping outside of thinking about here are our program outcomes, here are the courses that address those outcomes, here are some of the different levels where we're introducing, reinforcing, expecting a degree of expertise, and now we start to go in to look at what are the learning experiences they're getting, what are the outcomes we're expecting them to show proficiency in at what level as they move through their academic path. The next piece uh, was the importance of talking with colleagues and actually sharing your assignments. And that's not very comfortable. Certainly, it was not comfortable with me. And when I sent my assignment to uh, a number of my colleagues, they were somewhat surprised and did respond and said, here's what we see or what we don't see, and then gave that feedback back to me. And I think that's critically important because it helps us to be aware of the things that we're, in the ways that we're designing, the things we're asking for students to demonstrate in our assignments, and the way we're asking, and also that discussion should lead into um, how the students are doing and what learning experiences are they receiving in my class vis-a-vis -vis your, your class. Um, and prior, in the lower level, and in the upper level when they're approaching graduation. It's an iterative process, assignment and design, as well as course design, as well as program design. And what happens is you do the design of your assignment, you prepare those assignment instructions, your students go through, they complete the assignment, and now I've started to discuss with my students what it is they thought they were going to demonstrate, uh, where is it in their paper that they actually have demonstrated that. In my earlier experiences, um, particularly with my original assignment design, I did not do that. And I, and I also didn't give them adequate enough experiences in the classroom. So now I, we do some article analyses or some short papers together. I'll write it. Um, usually I have the economic theory completely accurate but I, I then look at um, some of the other areas where they can begin to identify where the paper is stronger or weaker. So they start to see how to write the paper, how to organize it, so that when they're expressing the quantitative literacy skills, um, they're able to do so in a way that builds um, and is understandable for the, for the reader. The other really important thing that I continually need to remind myself is all of this doesn't need to be done at once. I, I don't have to make sure I've gone through all of my assignments in every single course for the semester I'm teaching. If, if I felt that, I very quickly become over, overwhelmed. So as I am teaching, I'll begin to redesign one or two assignments in um, one, two, or three of my courses. And I'm finding there's some economies of scale, if you will, as uh, the, the steepest part of that learning curve is initially when you begin, but as you're doing this, it becomes a bit easier. And what I've in included in the handouts will be an example of another assignment that I won't talk about during the presentation, but that I'll allow you, allow you to have to reflect upon that is not nearly as detailed as the one that I did the first, first time around. So handout two looks at the original assignment instructions. Looking at the original assignment instructions, what I noticed is it wasn't a surprise that students were not, in fact, addressing assumptions. And in an introductory course, uh, I want them to begin to addressing assumptions. While they may not address the assumptions um, very well, they should at least be making it an attempt. But in that original assignment, I don't give them any types of assignment prompts. And I also thought back about my classroom presentations and our discussions. And while I would mention assumptions here and there, it was never something that was emphasized. It was never um, something that I asked them to take note of when they answered a question. Now I'm much more um, 
deliberate and intentional in looking at the kinds of dimensions um, within quantitative literacy or written communication or within the outcomes specific to my course that I'm reinforcing and asking students to talk about and reinforce in their own learning process. So that led to some significant redesign in this assignment. And I wanted to think about what is it. It's a quantitative literacy assignment. This is economics. The student should be expressing quantitative literacy in context of economic theory, economic policy. So then I looked to the value rubric, and that would be handout three in your packet, which is the value rubric for, so it looks like this one, the value rubric for quantitative literacy. And I began to look at those dimensions, those criteria within the value rubric. I was less concerned about the levels, whether it was level one, two, three, four, how those levels, um, the adjectives or the, or the words that were used to describe um, how we would begin to assess student work for, and where that student work would fall in that rubric. I was mostly just concerned with the broad dimensions, and those dimensions were ones that I would hope my students would begin to demonstrate even in an introductory course and show over the course of their academic career or their academic path improvements. That led to the redesign of my assignment. And so when you look at the redesign, you'll also note that I've annotated it. So I thought when I gave this to my colleagues and they told me what they saw or what they didn't see, I had no way to organize that relative to what I was seeing in those instructions um, to combine what I saw with what they saw and were the areas where there were some differences or were the areas where what they were seeing in the assignment instructions were in a very different place than what I saw. So I began to, and I, and I do this still with a bit less detail, annotate my assignment instructions. So if you look at handout number four, you'll see in the side the annotations where I note right here is where I'm really asking them to um, apply and analyze. Here's another place where I'm actually asking them to address assumptions. So I go through all of the value rubric dimensions and I made some adjustments in that assignment so that in fact I believe it addresses all of the criteria or dimensions within the quantitative literacy rubric. The question that I struggle with is how the, the degree of scaffolding, the length of the assignment, uh, what should I, how explicit should I go into those instructions? What should they know to do simply because of um, the course, our course discussions, what I've discussed that my expectations are, talked about that's really important in economic analysis? Should they be able to carry that over or should I be providing them um, really clear, detailed prompts? And in an introductory course, um, my thought was that having those really clear prompts was very important. So this includes many more prompts and much more detail in the assignment instructions that I would um, not likely include in an upper level course. And one of the conversations I had with Peggy Mackey, and many of you know Peggy Mackey as a, an ass assessment consultant um, who has visited many of the, the, the campuses um, across the nation and internationally, one of the observations that Peggy talked to me about was that we often have the same level of prompts and the same level of um, detail in our instruction assignments in our earlier courses as we do in our later courses. So, so that brings us back to thinking about how we look at the scaffolding, not just within our course, but across our courses. So if you look at handout number five, you'll see that that's a cover sheet and on the top it says quantitative literacy cover sheet and this is mapped against my new assignment instructions. The cover sheet is one document that we're going to ask faculty who are at an institution within a state participating in the multi-state collaborative to include when they send up or they volunteer to um, provide in ass the assignment instructions and the corresponding student work. What, the reason why we're asking faculty to fill out the cover sheet 
is we want some input on the faculty as to which of those dimensions in the quantitative literacy rubric or the written communication rubric or other rubrics that we may be assessing student work that you believe your assignment provides prompts for or if there's no assignment prompt, the dimensions that you'd believe the student should still be addressing in this specific um, piece of work that, that, that corresponds to that specific assignment. Scorers won't have the cover sheet uh, when they evaluate or assess that student work, but second level analysis would let us go back and in areas where a rate or a scorer may have said, we don't see any evidence of this. We want to go back second level analysis and, and see, did the instructor have any expectation that the student would address this um, or would not? And we want the instructor's input. And then that leads to a discussion with the instructor. Sometimes an instructor may say, well, I don't expect and the, the student to demonstrate this dimension Yet, when we read the student work, we see, we see the student addressing that. And, and that really reflects the student being able to carry over skills and, and proficiencies, competencies from earlier courses. And that transferability is extremely important uh, as the student is moving through their academic path. So this is one way we can look at whether students are demonstrating learning even when a specific course or a specific assignment isn't asking them to demonstrate that competency or proficiency. We always want to remember at the multi-state level that when we look at what students are demonstrating, we are looking at all of that learning up to the point where they enter your course as opposed to the learning that you get from the student receives from that course. And that's the same when we do program level assessment. We're looking at student work at specific points along the student's academic path, but that student work, the, the learning that they demonstrate, will, it will be, come from or reflect the learning that they acquired over their academic path, outside of their academic experience, um, within student affairs work that they're undertaking, lots and lots and lots of different areas um, where the student might pick up those competencies um, aside from our classroom. Handout number six, if you look at handout number six, is a grading rubric. And I included the grading rubric so that we would really be able to contrast the grading rubric and the detail within the grading rubric and the value rubric. So a value, the value rubric is very broad, and it's not designed to capture um, the, all of the learning outcomes that an assignment might address. So my, gra the, my grading rubric here is asking students specifically um, to, and you can see that in the assignment, for written what we would consider to be skills or competencies within the written communication outcome. And Students are asked to um, document. Students are asked to um, have an introduction and, and a conclusion, so to have some content development throughout their paper. When we grade, we're looking at all of these various dimensions, and the grade on that paper doesn't reflect just quantitative literacy, but it's a composite grade that reflects all of these different components. And sometimes we weight them, depending on the assignment, um, as opposed to just one outcome. Therefore, when we're assessing the student work, we don't want a, a assessors or evaluators or scorers to have those assignment instructions because it's really easy for us to slip back into the grading, the grading mode. The next handout that I've given you is an example of student work that resulted from that assignment. I made an attempt to, an to annotate that um, assessing that student work against the value rubric. I tried to, it, it was very difficult because I knew what the assignment instructions were. I knew um, or what grade I would give the student. So it was really hard for me just to focus in on the dimensions of the quantitative literacy outcome. But I attempted to do that. I attempted to annotate it 
And I thought that might be useful for you to have in your packet to look at that student work um, that was annotated. So the next handout I just want to mention briefly, it's handout, handout number eight, which is labeled answer key. When we're submitting student work to be assessed by somebody who may not be within our discipline, particularly for the component of quantitative literacy where we're asking students to do some calculation or s uh, some other type of representation of the problem, we want to provide an answer key to assist the scorer in correctly assessing that dimension. So in conclusion, the last packet in your handouts, and, and it's in a, little, in a packet, so I've combined that into one document, is an assignment for um, where I, I wanted to be able to assess that student work against written communication. It's from an upper level course, probably a course students would take um, in the beginning or the end of their third year, and therefore I was again struggling with the detail within that assignment. What, how many assignment prompts should I have for the dimensions or the criteria within the written communication value rubric? So I did the same thing. I had the original assignment, I have an annotated assignment, I have the cover sheet, and you'll notice in the cover sheet there's a lot less detail. So in the, my first cover sheet with my quantitative literacy, I, I put a lot more detail into, into completing it so I could get a really good sense of what I was looking for. So I hope that you find the YouTube presentation useful. I thank you very much for um, spending some time to listen to it. You're more than welcome to email me if you have questions. My email address is included on the PowerPoint slide on the, on the first page. Thank you very much.